Oh, Andy Mitten, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning, I'm fine. So, uh, traipsing three quarters of the way around the world to meet Diego Maradona. Um, I guess, you know, like if you were to go back and ask your 20 year old self what is one of the most exciting things you could be doing on earth, it would be traipsing three quarters of the way around the world to interview Diego Maradona. Without an appointment, by the way. <laughs> right. And, and it, it wasn't my idea. Um, 442's got a new editor in chief, James Brown, and he was the man behind Loaded in the, the 1990s. And he rang me up in uh, February and said, Why have you stopped doing stuff for 442? And I hadn't made a conscious decision. And I'd written for that magazine for 18 years, and I just took less this season for them. And he said, I'm, I'm going to be editor in chief. I want you back in. I want you to be editor at large. Um, and it's, it's like being a footballer where your manager says you, you've got a free role where do you want to play. <coughs> Why is Maradona in uh, Mexico, by the way? And I said, I, I have no idea. I didn't, I didn't even know he was there. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, in, um, he's at that club where Guardiola used to play. Go and see him. Go, go and see him. Yeah, but James, you know, Mexico's not like a bus ride away from where we're talking. So I looked into it and I saw not only was he in Mexico, he was in the most dangerous city in Mexico. The one where the American government and the British government and probably the Irish government says, do not travel to. This is category four dangerous. Do not go there. It's the same as Syria. Um, and I spoke to the club and they said Maradona does no interviews. So he's like he's like um, Guardiola, he's like Bielsa. He does no one-on-one -on -one sit-down interviews, which are the, the best part of my job. And I'm sure you can relate to this. If you get a good one-on-one, -on -one, it's fantastic. But please come and write about us. And I'm thinking, with respect to Dorados, they're not quite the name that Maradona is. And I see that the season's going to end. He's probably going to leave the club because he doesn't tend to hang around much. And I, I see that the season's ending in two weeks, so I'm going to miss him. Unless his team wins six out of the last eight games, get into the playoffs, come through the quarterfinals of the playoffs and the semifinals of the playoffs, then we've got a chance that Maradona is going to be in this city in Sinaloa, which all I've ever associated that word with is narco gangs. And they do all that. And I'm saying to the club, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Great, speak to the president, speak to the players. Well, that's fantastic, but with respect, I need to speak to Maradona. Yeah, well, he doesn't do any interviews. So I looked at the travel advice and I thought, what they're going to do? They're going to shoot me as I leave the airport. I'm not in the drugs trade. I'm going to get a cab. I'm going to go to uh, my hotel. And I needed a bit of luck and I got a bit of luck. His team were playing fantastically well. The players adore him. He's a good manager. Can you believe it? The last time I saw him was heavily intoxicated in the World Cup finals in a, in a private box, being escorted to hospital. And I made it to said, I'm sending a war photographer with you from the New York Times. So uh, she came to meet me. And he said, I want you to go to Juarez as well by the border. But that's not even dangerous anymore. Sinaloa is where the real danger is. And... I found out that his team had a training session. He was going to be there. I turned up. I find in journalism, if you just turn up, you've got half a chance. And there are so few people who would pay the type of money to say somebody's really respect the magazine for doing that. Because it cost them five grand you know, to spend me to send a photographer. And we arrived at the training session and the players were there and I put myself about. I did my job. And players are, hey, Manchester, Manchester. And that one word is a positive with footballers because they associate it not with rain or music, but with football. And then after an hour, I see Maradona. He can barely walk. He's wearing a cap with um, an image of that famous Argentinian, Diego Maradona, on his head. <laughs> and he's invited the ultras of his club along and they start singing songs to him and he sits on an ice box and starts dancing away to songs about him. And I speak to lots of people and the club president comes to speak to me and we speak for 70 minutes and we're getting bit by mosquitoes. And this is all great. You're the man who gave Maradona the job and you're telling me your doubts about Maradona and how, how pleased you are because he's doing really well and I can see the players love him. But, you know, I've come a long way and I won't mind a, a picture. We need, we need something. Ah, who told you he does no interviews? Well, everyone at the club. Ah, come on. And I'm thinking, I've got half a chance here. He's, he's the president. Have you met his wife, by the way? No, no. I mean, why would he have met Maradona's wife? Come here. So I go and get introduced to this lady. Where are you from? I'm from England. 
I've come here to write uh, an article about a man from uh, Buenos Aires called Diego. Ah, she laughs. But I said, he doesn't do interviews. I'm sure he'll speak to you. So eventually, after two hours, I get led onto the pitch, covered in mosquito bites. President goes up to him. He's sat on a mat. And he looks at me and he sort of waves me over. And he says, I should have had a penalty at Old Trafford in 1984. And actually, he should have done. And we start talking. And he says, yeah, I used to support Man United, but now I'm a Manchester City fan. You can't, you can't just change clubs. You can't just go from Boca to River. So, yeah, but Kun, Kun's part of the family and, you know, I speak to him a lot. And the great thing about Guardiola, and he starts rearranging these tactics on the floor. And it's brilliant. He's, so I'm getting a tactical lesson off Diego Maradona here about why Pep Guardiola is so fantastic. And then he starts saying to me about how good Graham Souness was and how good Brian Robson was. And and I said, you've, you know, what brought you to Mexico? I mean, I know you've been here before because you were in 86, weren't you? Oh, the greatest moment, he said, and he's, he's laughing at me because I'm English. And I'm telling him that I've been to Buenos Aires where the whole stadium is singing, if you don't dance, you're an Englishman. And he's, really, you've done this? I said, yeah, I've done it several times. And it still happens now. The Falklands War is still a huge issue in Argentina. But my backup plan is I'm, I'm from Dublin and I'm an Irish tourist. If it ever really comes on top in Argentina, I've only close come once to using the uh, the Dublin line. I need to read up on my geography of Dublin a bit more. And, and I end up chatting to Maradona and he's fantastic. And he says, you know, uh, the problem with the club you like is that they sell a lot of shirts, but they don't win any trophies. And I am the man to return this club to greatness. And I think it, I'm just smiling because I've got the interview, the job's in the bag. We've got pictures of him reading 442, which the editor's delighted with because his decision to send me has been vindicated. And he's, uh, he comes back, he makes a point of coming back to me saying, I, I, I mean what I said. Uh, I can get Man United back to greatness. I can become the coach. So as soon as this comes out, this is just going to be headline news. And the president's shaking his head because he doesn't want to lose his manager. But obviously... Man United may be seen as a step up from Dorados. Uh, not that I think that's going to happen for one minute, but I love that style of journalism. I think um, I love it when you've got an editor who's going to pay you and trust you to do that. I had a brilliant photographer. We went on to do another game there, the CONCACAF final in Monterey, where we were allowed to travel with the police in riot bands a few days later. and It was fascinating. It's, it's the, the best job I've done this year. Um, I love writing, I love meeting new people, I love finding out new stories and finding out why on earth Diego Maradona is in the drug capital of the world. Um, I didn't realise that uh, James Brown had taken the gig at 442 because those of us who are a certain age remember that there was a glory day of, of Loaded where um, before it descended and after he left really um, into uh, basically softcore porn. But at the start it had this kind of... It was like a, an English version of gonzo journalism properly done for the first time and, um, and it spawned a thousand imitators, but there was a magic about those first five, six, seven issues. I totally agree and the gonzo journalism, James is all for that. James says, put yourself into the story, explain why you're in Sinaloa and, uh, and, and, and be, you know, embed yourself in the story, get the reader to, to travel with you. And James is, ta James is talented. He's brilliant on captions. I've known him for a long time. And too much football journalism is very staid. It, it's, it's interviews from sponsors where, you know, Gareth Bale says he's happy when he scores goals. And I'm like, come on, we need more than this. If people are paying for a magazine, you need more than this. You need a proper story. And to marry the biggest names with great stories is difficult because the naturally circumspect. Lionel Messi doesn't really say anything. Because, one, he focuses on his football, but two, if he does say anything, it's twisted. And even with this Maradona stuff, you just know that there are elements who are going to twist it to have Maradona slamming Paul Pogba. And he wasn't saying that. He was saying he's a great player, just needs to work harder. And you always come back to thinking, is he ever going to just regret thinking, why on earth did I help that, that journalist out from, from Manchester? But... That's my job to do that, to work within what I think is right to do. 
um, to try and get the interviews, to try and get the stories. And I was stood outside the stadium in Sinaloa and these shifty looking guys are saying to me, you know, we've had a lot of problems with drugs here and, and explaining to me how the narco trade works. And it was absolutely fascinating. And then another saying, baseball is the biggest sport in this Mexican city. And I didn't know anything like as much I should know about Mexico. I travel a lot. I've got a, a thirst for knowledge, for news. But my knowledge of Mexico at the start was like, yeah, tequila, fajitas, um, zapatistas, a wall. And I was pleasantly surprised. The Mexican league is extremely wealthy. It's the fifth biggest league in the world. And Maradona found it a release to go there because he was relatively anonymous because he was in a city where baseball is the biggest sport. He can't live normally in Argentina. He can't go to Napoli. And he was really enjoying himself. And I saw a happy man, one um, who, who mentally was as sharp as I've seen him for a long time. Physically, he can't do it. You know, he really he struggles to walk. But I saw his players. They absolutely love him. One of them had a tattoo on his leg of Diego Maradona. And I'm thinking, you're, you're a goalkeeper. This, this isn't going to last forever. He's probably going to leave within six months. And he took them within a game of promotion to the Mexican top flight. It's almost impossible to get promoted in Mexico. It's a closed shop. And he almost did it. So I was very happy with the story. But it would have been the absolute perfect story if he would have taken them to promotion. But I, I like that style of journalism. I think it's worth paying for. And all you see now is... Maradona, Man United, 500 words. They robbed the juiciest quotes. You see that everywhere. That's not 10% of the story. It's a massive 4,000 word piece with brilliant photography with the, with the war photographer who was like five foot nothing, absolutely fearless. And it's fantastic at a job and more power to the elbow of people like that. Yeah, it's a, it is an incredible story. Um, the the situation is he going to stay there next season? Do you know is that has that been established yet, or is has that adventure run its course? Uh, no, I don't know if he's going to stay there. No, I don't think it's been established yet. Um, he told me that he wanted to stay, that he had unfinished business to do. But I always sense if you look at his career, he hasn't tended to stay too long. What did surprise me is he's clearly got something. He's not a joke. He, he, his, his players respond to him when he took over the team when near the relegation zone and football's a results business and he gets results but he's got such a patchy CV he's been everywhere you know that he, Man United are never going to give him the job a big club's never going to give him the job but since the story broke a couple of days ago Manchester United fans are so desperate that some of them are saying you know what it'd probably be, be more fun <laughs> than what we watched for the last few years uh, I, I was pleased because he his health seems to be in a much better place I met his children when he was there well some of his children and he, he seemed to be enjoying it I just thought it was a good football story that this club clearly a bit different this club why on earth did Pep Guardiola go there for example and and, and they, they oh, and attendances surged everyone I spoke to absolutely loved him and you saw side angles, people saying, oh, he was in the hospice for the street kids last week. He turned up unannounced. Oh, right, with a photographer. No, no, no. Came by himself. He kissed every child there. Kissed. And he gave some money. And I know it's very easy to vilify Maradona. I know he's made lots of mistakes. I'm not going to pretend that he's a saintly figure. But I will say that there's lots of very good sides to his personality as well. Um. Look, it, it's obviously a complicated story. The, the movie is out pretty soon. We're going to give people a, a chance to go and, um, and see it for themselves. I, I didn't realise Guardiola had been there. When Was that like after his um, trip to Italy? When was he there? Yeah, it was after his indiscretions in Italy. Um, he was there, I think it was about 2006, and he, he spent half a season there. And... He became friends with people there. So when I spoke to the president, he said, ah, oh, you know, Pepe, and, and he'd just been to see him in Manchester. So Pepe clearly uh, enjoyed his time there. And I think he enjoyed the anonymity as well, which he wouldn't get in, in Barcelona. And Pep went to Brescia, he went to Sinaloa. He, he goes, he went 
with the unconventional towards the end of his, his career, but they're not a huge club. It's not a football city. Average crowds are 7,000, 15,000 when they're doing well. It's hard to get to. It is extremely dangerous. I didn't have one problem when I was there, but statistically, it is extremely dangerous. I did think of setting myself up as a, an English drug dealer on a street corner <laughs> just to see the, the reaction and how long it would take me, but the photographer said, you've pushed your luck enough here. You've yeah, not gone right through this city. Get enough. back to the hotel. If, uh, if you get in trouble in Buenos Aires and somebody says to you, um, uh, you know, what's the, what's the crack? And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm a tourist from Dublin. What's your accent, Andy? How does that go? Oh, yo, yo soy de Irlanda. Yo soy de, de Dublin, el capital de Irlanda. Soy turista. Ah, you... I'm, a, I'm a tourist from... Uh, but if you're going to try and get me to put a Dublin accent... <laughs> you're doing it in Spanish. That was I'll, it. I'll, I'll, I'll do an interview in a Dublin accent the day after Manchester United next win the European Cup. Okay, well, so we're looking at 2028, 20, probably. If, uh, well, that would be okay. It'd take one win in the next decade. Speaking of Man United, what the hell is going on? Where is this technical director? Who is in charge? Who is actually responsible for the fact that there hasn't been any, any clear signs yet of any proper, tangible transfer activity? Ed Wood was in charge. And he's a leading executive and he's under fire because the team is failing. The club has failed in the last year. Uh, United have wanted to appoint a sporting director and while there are mitigating factors, the roles changed, for example. Jose Mourinho didn't want one, for example. There has been no appointment. And that's fine. If there's going to be no appointment, fine. But the club have briefed that there's going to be an appointment for over two years now. I wrote the original story. I remember where I was. I was on a train to Basel uh, when, I got the, when I got the story. And then it was more of an administrative role, but then it became one where the person would have more of a role in involved in transfers, like you see at some of the biggest clubs in the world where the technical director is this really ultra-connected, multilingual person who is so plugged into football's grapevine that not only does he know that uh, Palermo have got a brilliant right-back, he knows who his agent is and he knows who's tapped him up and he knows that he's already agreed to go to Milan or, or whoever. And that appointment has yet to be made. Uh, United fans are not happy. The mood is very despondent among Manchester United fans. Fans who've been very patient, especially at matches. There is a different type of Man United fan. You get the, the knee-jerk reactionistas on social media. Um, but, but the patient type are getting pretty frustrated. The season was wretched how it ended. Those two wins in 12 games. There have been no signings yet. I think you've got to judge them on the signings when the season starts. I think that's fair. But it would do no harm whatsoever if Manchester United signed players early on and showed their intent, be it by buying young, talented players, um, predominantly British players, uh, or be it by whatever they're going to do. They will lift the, the mood off the floor. It hasn't been helped by Manchester City winning the league so convincingly nor Liverpool winning the European Cup. This is like the perfect storm against Manchester United fans. And part of me smiles because I've seen United win just about everything. I've enjoyed the great moments and I think I've just got to take it on the chin at the moment when things aren't, aren't going your way. But there are worries about the club and uh, I think the club have got to be decisive um, this summer. And we've got to get rid of some players. Oli Gunnar wants to be decisive. Action's going to speak louder than words. Yeah, I, we were chatting earlier on in the game more than anything about where players are going to be next season. Owen thinks there's a good chance Pogba isn't at Manchester United. You know, if you were a betting man at the minute and we were uh, giving you a stack of chips to push on, do they end on red or do they end somewhere else on white or black and white? It's so nuanced, everything. The club don't want to sell him, but then the manager knows that He's not always a positive influence in the dressing room, but he also knows he's very professional when he's training. Um, Pogba wants to play in a freer role. He got that when Ole Gunnar came, then he didn't get it towards the end. He didn't have a good relationship with Jose Mourinho. He wants to leave Manchester United. United don't want to sell him. Clubs don't have the money to afford the type of transfer fee. So it's really difficult to call on Pogba. I think if Madrid came in with a massive offer, uh, that would be extremely tempting to the player and to Man United. But I don't think Madrid have got the money. After buying uh, Hazard and, and um, uh, Jovic. So, 
I think United want to keep the biggest names. They want them to come good. They want to give them more chances. But And I do have some sympathy for the club. They've offered David De Gea a contract to make him the best paid player, goalkeeper in the world. And it's not enough. I mean, how far do Man United push this? You know, De Gea didn't finish the season strongly either. And I think United, with the second highest wage bill in world football, they've got to start getting more value out of the players they've signed. And much as I would want to criticise the recruitment strategy, because it has failed, they have backed the managers. United have spent an awful lot of money, badly. Yeah, I wonder if they need to hit the reset button. And um, I was talking to a bunch of Man United fans <coughs> recently who were all saying that they feel like the Sanchez contract has kind of poisoned what's going to happen, because everybody comes in and wants it. And until you become the club who doesn't pay the Sanchez money, you are the club that pays the Sanchez money. So that's the expectation set. Everybody's wages inflate to a level that's higher than uh, what they should be. And so it's hard to get value for money at that point. I welcome the Sanchez signing like every single Man United fan I know. No matter what people now say in hindsight, I'd watched him closely when he was at Barcelona. I'd watched him when he was at Udinese, a little bit at Arsenal. It just hasn't worked out. It, it has been a dreadful signing. And I don't think that he wanted it to turn out like this. It's just how it's turned out. And his wages, because he came on, what, well, a kind of free transfer, even though Mkhitaryan went the other way. He got, he got this really inflated deal. United found that Manchester City wanted him. And the agent was in the perfect position because he could push for more money. He got more money. Everyone got the lift when he arrived. And he was brilliant in his first game at Yeovil away, but Yeovil were 90, 90th in the Football League and he's going to be judged against much better opposition and it hasn't happened. Uh, I don't think he's happy. He's not particularly popular in the dressing room and it's just been a failed signing and it's not been the only one. And I think United, as you alluded to, they've got to be stronger. They've got to be getting more value out of players. And what you've had is some players going to the club and saying... I'm more important than Alexis Sanchez. I deserve a 60% pay rise. Well, 20 players could say that they're more important than Alexis Sanchez. That doesn't make it right. Manchester United shouldn't be six. They shouldn't be failing like they failed last year. OK, football's cyclical. I do think Man United will eventually come good. Liverpool fans were even saying that to me in Madrid, which was a delight for me to be at, at the weekend, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, but at the moment, there's very little light in, in, in this tunnel. And I'm sure all non-Man United fans watching this, I'm sure their hearts are bleeding. <laughs> Andy, good stuff. I'm really looking forward to picking up a copy of 442. Thanks a million for joining us. Thank you. It's uh, Andy Mitten there, uh, newly appointed editor at large of uh, 442.